background one was. I had my own projector and I must have left it at a presentation and it went away. I was really disappointed, but I don't do as many presentations yeah. as I used to. Well, most of them, well, most of the rooms are already connected, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a good point, though. I'll leave that there if I don't think of yeah. it. Yeah. No, keep them, keep it up. It's not that hard. Jeffrey, it's okay. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to get started. I just want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to come to a public, thank you, <laughs> whoever whistled, a public input meeting. I'm Kathy Williams, the town planner, um, and I'm just going to introduce some of the consultants from VHB who are working with us tonight. We have um, Jeffrey Morrison Logan. Evan Miller, Hi. Trish Domigan, and Lori Allo, a Aho, Aho. Yes. sorry, excuse me. So a lot of you probably remember a few years ago um, when we started taking a look at Route 6A, it initially started with some concerns about safety, and we teamed up with the Cape Cod Commission to do a uh, road safety study, and we came up with a lot of ideas or recommendations to try and improve the safety and slow down the speed along that section, and we were fortunate enough to get some improvements that were done. Some of it was that you might be aware of are the flashing sh are the Chevron signs at the Summer Street. We did get a flashing um, speed sign. We also got some new signs at the crosswalks. So after that, everyone like, okay, what else can we do to make uh, Route 6A look better? So we again teamed up with the Cape Cod Commission and worked with them on a Route 6A corridor study that was done in 2017. And as part of that, they came up with a bunch of different recommendations um, with regard to different things that we can do for pedestrian accommodations, for crosswalks, maybe some improvements uh, to the streetscape in the village center area. Um, so what we've done is we've teamed up with VHB to help us put some visualizations to those recommendations so you can get a much better idea of what we're actually talking about whether than, rather than just the words, you can actually see the pictures and get a better idea. Um, we're also doing, at the same time, a water main replacement project along Route 6A, so it sounds like a good time to maybe try and combine some of these things all in one. I just really want to emphasize tonight that these are preliminary concepts. Nothing has been decided. Do not freak out by anything that you see. We just need to put some things on a piece of paper so you guys can take a look at it and you can provide your input back to us. So there's no funding for this and there's no defined project at this point. We're really looking for your help to, to make that pr uh, defined project happen. Um, one other thing that we kind of need to talk about a little bit is Route 6A is a state highway. So that kind of complicates things a little bit. They own the roadway. So how we might move forward with some projects, how it gets permitted, and who pays for it. Those are some things that we'll need to, to work very closely with MassDOT as we move forward. But what we're trying to get to um, tonight is that defined project that we can then bring to MassDOT and have those different types of discussions. Um, so at that point, I'm going to turn it over to VHB to give their presentation. Thanks, Kathy. Can you guys hear me okay with a microphone up here? Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We're really excited to have a great conversation with you. Um, we love working with communities just like yourself in terms of understanding what's already great within your community, where we can help you maybe make a, a few tweaks, build upon a lot of great work that's already been done, as Kathy mentioned, over the years, and really try to help you get you, you to where you really want to be. Um, I think credit to the town in terms of taking a lot of these steps, which were really helpful to us as a team in terms of looking at a lot of the prior steps studies, the recommendations, and so forth. And I think you'll hear from our whole team how important it is for us to make sure that whatever we do out there is really context sensitive, really thinks about the character, the scale, the texture, all of those great things that are happening along Route 6A today as well. And I think as we're going through this, we'll try to make sure that we point out where there's areas that we want to talk a little bit more specifically about some of those tweaks that we're talking about and some of those upgrades from safety perspective, transportation perspective, mobility. We'll also talk about parts of the core where there's not going to be a significant amount of change. It might just be replacing sidewalks, maybe cleaning up the curb cut. So we'll try to make some of those distinctions as we go through so that when we get to the back of the evening, maybe we spend most of our time about where you'd like to talk and where you'd like to understand how we can make some of those changes together and really make sure that we're moving forward in the right way. So a little bit about the agenda. Um, we already did a little bit of the welcomes and the introductions. So my role at VHB is I'm the director of our planning and urban design and landscape architecture team. So we're the folks that love visioning, d doing the pretty picture drawings, and really trying to figure out how to translate your words into the vision. And you'll see a lot of the great graphics tonight in terms of before and afters. And hopefully, uh, you'll th some of this will resonate with you in terms of things that you like. It's OK if you don't like some of them. We'd love to hear the feedback uh, on that as well. We'll talk a little bit deeper dive about the 
project background, I think it's really important to understand how we've leveraged the work that has been done in the past, picking up on those recommendations and moving them forward. It's very common that you'll work at a very macro level and as you progress further, you'll get into more and more details as we go. So we'll show you how, ma how we made some of those steps. Um, we'll also talk about design objectives and a little bit about why it's important with projects like this to not only just replace certain parts of it, but to use this as an opportunity to maybe meet today's standards. I think you'll see through some of the photos that we'll show you in a few minutes, there's, there's a fair amount of deficiencies out there today in terms of how the sidewalks work, where people park, maybe where they should or shouldn't park, crosswalks that lead to nowhere in terms of where the community is um, and where you can walk through the community, um, and some simple safety upgrades and, and vehicle upgrades. We'll talk about those as we go through. The so the design objectives and criteria become pretty important. Um, we'll review the concepts. There's many different places to stop along the corridor. You'll see some animations and some fly-throughs as we go through this, so I think it'll be kind of fun for you to see the differences there. Um, and then we'll come back at the end and we'll have a discussion. And I think the important part about the discussion is we'd like to really structure where we can actually go through each of those sections. We'll be taking some flip note charts up here as well to s understand what you like, what you dislike, where we need to do a little bit more homework. And I think really we'll spend most of the evening talking to you about um, what you like to see happen. So we, we thought it would be best if we walk through the whole presentation as quickly as we can, arm you with as much information as possible, then we'll come back to the, the Q&A at the back end as well. So public meetings, this is the second of the three public meetings that we have scheduled. We had one last week, which was great in terms of understanding uh, what was happening with the community <coughs> during the day. This one's specifically targeted towards the evening hours to reach out to folks that were available during the evening hours. And we have another one coming up on the 22nd at 2 p.m. Intentionally staggered throughout the day to get different audiences to come out as well. A little bit about the project limits. You can see on the graphic that's up here. We're extended east to west on the graphic. We have Willow Street that's off to the left-hand side over here. We're just starting to the east side of that intersection. And then over on the right-hand side, you'll see Union Street, which is over here as well. And we're starting just to the west-hand side of Union Street as well, just to keep it between those two uh, intersections. What's also important on this graphic is to notice where we have highlighted this yellow. In terms of the areas that have a little bit um, more change versus a lot that's going to kind of stay the same, we really want to spend quality time talking about the village center, which is really the heart of the downtown community in here as well. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about there. As we go through the rest of the section, we'll also point out where there might be some modest change in terms of maybe adding a sidewalk, cleaning up a few little things along the way as well. So with that, um, let's talk about some of the prior studies. Trish, do you want to dive in and give us some of the updates? Sure. Um, my name is Trish Domigan. I'm the Director of Municipal Services at VHB. I'm helping Jeffrey and, and the design team on this project. And I, I just want to point a few things out. Jeffrey had mentioned that there's three public meetings that have been scheduled so far for the project. All of the public meetings will be presenting the same thing. Um, we had the, the meeting last week. We, we wanted to give a little bit more information in terms of what already has been done, um, and that's how this presentation has been updated. But essentially, all of the concepts that you've seen are going to be the same for all three presentations. So the prior studies, could I have the clicker? Thank you. Um, that have been done, as Kathy Williams had mentioned, is um, that there has been a roadside safety audit completed for 6A back in 2013. Does everyone know what a roadside safety audit is? So it's, it's essentially taking a look at the, the features along the roadway to see what the safety deficiencies are in terms of multimodal transportation. So how pedestrians walk along the corridor or how cyclists may walk, um, not walk along the corridor, but ri ride their bikes along the corridor and, and also vehicles, crosswalks, wheelchair ramps, things like that. So in 2013, there was a need because there was, from the three-year period ahead of that, there were over 70 accidents that occurred within this section of the corridor. So there was a pretty significant need for um, some type of evaluation of safety features. I, I'll get into the specifics on that in a minute. After that, um, there was a, 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 an ask, a, a demand, or a cry for a little bit more evaluation. So in 2016-2017, the town partnered with Cape Cod Commission to take a, a further look at the, the street, the corridor, the streetscape study for um, the 6A corridor. And it was great because there was a lot of collaboration. There was a few public meetings at that time. There was some results, some recommendations to advance into concept plans. And that's where we're at tonight is we're, we're just next step after the evaluations in 2017. So the roadside safety audit. This graphic here 
has a little pop to it, I'd say. But um, so what this shows is where the accidents occurred between 2010 and 2013. Um, some of the, so what happens is all of the um, different departments in the town in Mass DOT walk the corridor and they evaluate the different features on the corridor. And the results of the roadside safety audit that occurred was, um, as I said, over 73 accidents, but the, the speed limit varied throughout the corridor, which was a little bit curious. The crosswalks, the paint that was used for the crosswalks and the locations weren't visible. So that was something that was noted. Um, the signs that are along the corridor are old, and what I mean for signs is not the private signs, I mean the regulatory signs, the speed limit signs, the, the crosswalk signs, things like that. They're old, they're not compliant, they're not visible. Um, there was poor lighting in terms of seeing the roadway, but also where the crosswalks were. Um, the sight distance, so what sight distance means is when you're turning around a curve and you're actually trying to look beyond the curve to see what's happening, that the sight distance is poor. So there's vegetation in the way or the curve's too sharp for the, the posted speed limit, things like that. Um, at the time, there was a passing zone within the village and that's been eliminated so far. So <laughs> I think that was the no-brainer, right? <laughs> Um, and also, cyclists and pedestrian access was lacking. So, you know, there's sidewalks along the corridor, you all know that, but there are gaps in them. There's, the, there's some of the sidewalks are really poor, they're tripping hazards. I know I trip a lot. So, um, there's just a lot of things that have to get improved in terms of pedestrian access. And also, for cyclists, um, it's a share the road situation right now, and, and I can get a little bit into that um, in a little bit. So some of the recommendations that happened um, as a result of the RSA was there were chevrons put at Summer Street, there were advisory sign um, postings at some of the, the substandard curves, um, the passing zone was eliminated, the crosswalk signage was installed at the crosswalk so people could see where to, to cross over 6A, and LED street lights were put into the overhead the, the Cobras um, along the corridor. And I just wanted to know, I found this really impressive. So there were 73 accidents before 2013, and then from the period between 2013 and 2016, there was 11 accidents. So just those improvements reduced the amount of accidents along the corridor pretty drastically. Um, but there were still some deficiencies along the corridor, and, and again, it's a beautiful corridor. The context is, is fabulous. It's a, it's a historic area. I really do enjoy driving down it slowly. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's things that really do have to be considered in terms of, and I'm, I'm saying multimodal transportation, so the way that pedestrians walk, or the way that cyclists are, are using it, things like that. So. Um, the town called out to Cape Cod Commission in 2016 and, and asked them to take a look at a little bit more. And some of the um, things that they did look at was parking, the type of curbing that's, that's being used along the corridor or lack of curbing, which I think there's a lot of that also. Where the crosswalks are situated right now and, and, and how the crosswalks are visible. You know, that it's, it's interesting because you think a crosswalk is a crosswalk, but there is different treatments that are more effective in certain situations how the signage isn't used, and again, it's not the private signs, it's the public signs, the regulatory signs, the directional signs, wayfinding signs. Geometric changes, so what this means is how the intersections, how the side roads actually come into 6A, and is there any improvements that could occur at those side roads to make it a little bit, I don't want to use the word safer, but a little bit easier to use the intersections themselves. Um, one of the strong notes was to maintain the historic character. And then there's a, a, there were a few things, incidentals. Oh, by the way, the maintenance of the corridor. You know, the sidewalks, pavement markings, drainage, signage, vegetation bruning to improve the site distance, things like that that um, came out of the, the corridor study. So the recommendations, you know, there, there were two public meetings in 2016. I'm not sure if anyone was there at the time. But there were some um, public workshops that occurred. And the, the, the way that they came up with some of the recommendations was there was a poll. There was a survey essentially done at those public meetings. And you know the, the summary is pedestrian cycling accommodations along the corridor, uh, parking, and the definition of where parking is. There are people that are parking along 
the corridor in places where they should be parking and then in places where they shouldn't be parking. So I think that's something that has to be considered. Um, improvements to the signage that's out there right now. You know, there's, there's signage and then there's signage and then there's over signage. So I think that, that there was some consideration or there, it has to be a little bit more thoughtful on how the signs are placed out there. And then the report said miscellaneous speed management, which um, at the past meeting that we had last week, we heard a, a little bit about speed management. You know, the historic content and not changing the corridor was very important. Um, stormwater, there's a lot of areas where there's ponding happening and I think that has to do with the type and treatment of the curbing or the edge of roadway that's out there right now. Um, utilities, the overhead utilities, not the underground utilities. So the overhead utilities and, and what to do about those. Um, vegetation management in terms of trimmings, things like that, decorative lighting and street amenities. So those are the things that came out of the 2016-2017 study and that's where we're coming up and moving forward from there. So these are the recommendations that were made a couple years ago and what we're presenting to you tonight is just how to put those recommendations to paper to make it more visible so that you can see what the ideas were back then. Um, all of this will be on the, the town website. This is really hard and I'm not going to read it, but one of the things um, that I just wanted to show you here in this slide is, you know, there were a number of recommendations that occurred as a result of the public process that happened in 2016 and it's really interesting because some of the things that are on, well, actually a lot of the things that are on this table were also discussed last week that it's a continuing concern that the residents had for improvements along the corridor itself, but don't change the historic context. Um, one of the things that we noted, and one of the things that I want to make sure that everyone understands is, you know, the bike accommodations that along the corridor, so there's different bike treatments that you can do based on the type of roadway and the type of cycling use that's on that roadway. Um, right now, it's a bike route. It's a share the road roadway. If we were to have either separated bike accommodations like a bike path next to the roadway or separated bike lanes or even bike lanes on the roadway, you would have to widen the roadway out. And we don't want to do that. So one of the things that we were looking to do is look for an alternate route. So the town is now in the design process of building the Cape Cod Rail Trail Phase 3, which is going to go from where Phase 2 at... Um, Thank you. And um, all the way to Barnstable and through Barnstable. So that's going to be the alternate bike route, the off-road accommodation that's along 6A that people can use if they don't want to share the road. But, you know, like I said, the other alternative would be bike lanes, which have to be 5 feet wide, a bike path, which would be 10 feet wide on the side of the roadway, or separated bike lanes, which are offsets and safety considerations and stuff like that. Um, the pedestrian accommodation, so, you know, there, there's sidewalks. I, this is really hard to see and I'll just step through it. So this is the, the limits of the Carter that we're talking about. Um, let's see, Union Street is down here and Willow Street is right here. So I don't know if you can see this, but the purple dashed is where the existing sidewalks are. So there's sidewalks from Willow Street up to Summer Street on both sides. And then from Summer Street to Willow, uh, to Union Street, it's only on one side. So that's just something to consider. So there's, there's gaps in, you know, a complete streets type roadway where you have sidewalks on both sides of the street. So that's something to think about also. And that was something that um, came out of the, the study from 2016, 2017, where there was a gap in the sidewalks from, especially Summer Street to where the post office is. That was something that came out that there's a desire line there, which means that the pedestrians want to be on this side of the roadway, but there's no access, there's no universal access there. So that's just something that we would be taking a look at also. And just quickly, we observed that while that red, <laughs> darker, thicker line is not out there today, there's a series of crosswalks out there right. today that lead you basically to nowhere. So it's right. like you're kind of there, but like what do you do when you get to the other side? So I think you'll see how we're right. thinking about making more connections in the right locations. Yeah, so the, the little circles here, the purple circles, are the locations where there are crosswalks 
but they don't have, so you have crosswalks, which is great to get across the street, but to make them universally, uh, universally accessible to meet federal standards, they have to have a sidewalk, a, a destination point, a wheelchair ramp, sidewalks, things like that, and that, th th they're just lacking on this side. So that's just something to consider also. <clears throat> so we just wanted to introduce a few pictures here just to, to remind every, well, what we observed and to remind everyone what the features are out in the corridor. And Laurie's going to come up here and help me out in a minute, but should I keep going? You want to go? Oh, well, this okay. I think it's interesting for you to hear it from the different parts of our team, from a planner, landscape, architect, uh, engineer. engineer perspective. Yep. Because when we look at photos like this, we truly see different things. We you sure know, do. I, I love the... <laughs> oh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, clearly you have a wonderful downtown, the character, the history from the outside in, right? But as you get closer <laughs> towards the road and think about the edges and those interfaces between those different users, I think there's uh, things that we can really approve upon. Right. So from an engineering perspective, I'm sorry. Don't keep going there. <laughs> um, so the, the, there were used to, there's a sidewalk here, right? There's a sidewalk over here. There's a sidewalk here. There used to be granite curbing along the edge of the sidewalk that over the years and with maintenance and things like that, you know, they, it just got paved over and over and over. Um, from an engineering perspective, we see that there's probably a drainage issue here because of the sand collection. The, the sidewalks are not ADA compliant, which means, I won't get technical, but it's the cross slope has to be a certain um, profile, uh, the profile has to be a certain um, percent, and then the, the cross slope has to be a per, uh, certain percent. You do see this truck though, right? You, you and I can agree that I, there's a truck it, there. It is okay. a black truck on there um, as well. The other yes. thing that I notice are the utility poles and the locations of the utility poles with respect to where the sidewalk is. And from, and from the other perspective, when you think about someone walking down the street and trying to figure out where's the sidewalk, where's the edge, I'm a str I have a stroller, I've got kids, the, the more you can define who is supposed to be where, whether it's certain materials, colors, whatever, there's many different ways of doing that, the more you can be clear, I think it just helps out everyone in terms of a scale, character, all those things I think you're desiring in this area. Right. The other thing that's interesting, just as a note that I just noticed, is you have a private walkway that kind of peters out here that doesn't tie into the sidewalk. And also that this car is up on the curb, that they're parked here. So, you know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the things that came out of the study that we were looking at was, you know, how do, we, how do we better define where people can park and not park so that they're not parking up on the sidewalk? You know, is there enough accommodation in the areas that you need it for parking? So that was something that we wanted to look at. Yeah, so I think that same theme here, when you think about what we call it the village center, right? There's that critical area in yellow that I showed you on that map where these issues become much more um, uh, visible because you're trying to do so many different things with so many different users along here. That whole idea of the curb that comes along here, driveway access, look at how wide the sidewalk is. It narrows down in the foreground here, gets a little bit wider in the background here. In order to do some of these upgrades and standards, look at how undulating it is. It's all cracked and so forth. Is it separated from the road? A little bit of separation for the pedestrian that's walking along the way. Does it meet the standards for sidewalk widths? I would argue that many of these places, if you added one extra foot, maybe a foot and half, you'd meet a lot of these standards. Right. So some of these things we're talking about are s a little bit of tweaks here and there that would let you meet these standards and really make it uh, better for a lot of people. Right. And you know, when you drive down the roadway, and these are just minor things that we're, we're talking about. They're not major wholesale changes. But when you, when you drive down the roadway, you don't really, unless you're an engineer or an urban planner, um, see from here to here. You look at the beautiful context that you're in. And what we do is we drive down the roadway and go, oh boy, this, this driveway is about to go. So, you know, it's just things that you want to take a look at to enhance what you already have out there. Um, again, the granite curbing is here that's buried by the sidewalk. So, you know, there's a lot of things that have to um, be improved if you wanted to. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll dive in here too. So uh, what's also interesting is you can actually see the town's, um, I think, really positive attempts at trying to mediate some of these issues. So where it has the no parking sign up there today, realizing that there's issues, we call it the grass strip, where part of it's uh, this kind of uh, dirt path that's, that's formed over time there. Notice how far the sidewalk is separated from that path, and the idea of drainage issues, barriers, trying to get people to do the right thing in the right place. So uh, a lot of folks at the last week's meeting said, well, how can we maybe do minor things and maybe not clean up too much? Uh, we just wanted to point out that the things that are out there today that are these temporary solutions that really haven't had the benefit of trying to figure out a permanent solution to clean these things up in a way that ties us stuff together versus sticking out as a funny little block that's trying to do things that really probably shouldn't be that that way in the long term. So there's a few of those things that exist throughout the corridor. I think this is a good opportunity. I think this is a good opportunity as well to point out the narrowness of a sidewalk here and to have something that's universally accessible for all users would require a minimum of a five foot wide sidewalk so you can allow for two wheelchairs to pass uh, uh, on each other. So not going any wider than that, we do have some options later in, in the uh, presentation where we might consider some options in certain areas, but just uh, inherently fixing those little tweaks like Jeffrey and Trish mentioned that can accommodate all users equally. And again, by fixing the sidewalk, we wouldn't be doing anything to the fence or anything like that, anything beyond the sidewalk. It would just be within the, the public way. Yeah, so here we're down at Summer Street as we're uh, looking back to the village center on the left-hand side here. Uh, and, and just as, as an aside, our whole team had a chance to walk the whole corridor, so it was fantastic to see it firsthand. Um, clearly, the, the trough feature that's here at the side here, the wonderful history that's here as well. We put the blow-up image in the bottom right there. It is a fantastic feature here as well. But then we asked ourselves the question, when you're trying to do a study like this with well, a list that Trish showed you before, are there certain cleanup things that you can do around the edges? We were trying to find ways to make that experience about celebrating the history a little bit more significant than having nothing along the edge and really just seeing it from the backside. So we'll show you an option in a few minutes about where we can maybe uh, enhance that as well. But whether you like that option or not, we think there's something that we can do, whether you keep it in place there, really to give it the prominence that it deserves right around that edge. So whether it stays or it goes, we're going to be looking hard to make sure that we give it that prominence. Because right now, it's competing with a lot of things. The drainage is in the bottom there. The signs for the traffic that are competing right next to it's almost bigger than the actual feature itself, it you is, know, um, yeah. and the yeah. granite curbs are starting to fall apart. There's not a lot of depth to the sidewalk behind it. But again, with a few little tweaks, if, if you keep in that spot, it can get a lot more prominent. And th then the other thing is it, it is such a feature and, and people are very, uh, they, they love it. They love this feature. They want to take a look at it. But from the roadway perspective, it is right along the, the curb line, which means that you would have to look at it on the opposite side. Or if you get into the intersection itself, because this is such a wide intersection, there's no pedestrian um, buffer or anything like that. You would be within the travel lane. And again, the roadway itself, um, it's just, it, it's a little bit worn. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to be gentle, right? <laughs> right go ahead. Um, so I guess here, uh, we, I mentioned early in the, in the conversation that we very much see many parts of the corridor having some uh, what we call more modest changes, but a couple things to point out here. This is the large section of the corridor that, this is a large section of the corridor that only has a sidewalk on one side. So the question is, do you really, really want to connect both sides? And if, the, if that is the S is the case, we really need to introduce it in certain locations. The second part here is, notice how close the sidewalk is to the roadway. So when you think about the travel speeds, the vehicles going by, the width of that sidewalk, is it elevated and separated? Is there a grass little strip between that or not? Those are the tweaks we'd like to talk to you about tonight to be able to make it, uh, take it to that next level as well. So l a little tweaks in this area, but very important ones, I would argue, too. Right, and just for a point of reference, this is the post office, correct? And then this is Summer Street up here, so you can see what where you are here. Do you want to go on this one? Sure. So this is at Church Street. This is um, the sidewalk area that comes up on the retaining wall. So the retaining wall is right here, and this is the sidewalk here. So when we were saying that accessibility and, and um, universal accessibility, so your profile, the running profile is four and a half percent is the maximum, and this is probably an eight to ten percent profile. So there's a little bit of a, this does not meet current standards, um, federal standards for it. So this is something that we want to take a look at. And the, the thing that we are looking at is the railing itself um, needs to get updated to meet um, 
Massachusetts AAB, which is the um, Architectural Access Board, also the utility pole that's protecting the wall. Um, you can see it has a little bit of of um, war, war scars here. So, you know, there's things that we, we would have to take a look at. And also to note that this here, this granite monument is a bound, so this is where the limit of the state highway is. That actually um, marks out where the state highway uh, layout line is. And, and that's in lies the challenge here. If you had tons of room across here, you could put a lot of different things in this cross section of the road, the width of the road here. Right. But we fully recognize that you're working with a pretty tight roadway. So these every foot really matters in terms of what you want to spend that foot doing for different modes, different users. Right. And you know, we, we look at advantages and disadvantages. So we're not going to be making recommendations to designs that you don't want, you know, some some improvements. So these these are the features that, you know, we do want to talk about tonight. So this is one of the <laughs> locations. I, I love this picture. So the, this picture up here is if you're to have a sidewalk, you have cement concrete wheelchair ramps for um, accessibility on either side going along a roadway. And this is the, one of the crosswalks that are at the church where there's no, there's no connection to the sidewalk. I think there's a sidewalk over here. But there's a crosswalk here, which is great, but there's no like landing area for universal accessibility. So that's just something that we would be considering as small tweaks to make sure that people can get from where the sidewalks are to the crosswalks. And, and you might recognize the picture in the upper left. That's just down the street in Brewster. So we just kind of went along 6A to see if there's a spot where they're already implementing yeah. some of these similar improvements as well. Right. So we're going to switch over to Lori now. So um, that's, what I think, Lori helpful background. So hopefully you see your own corridor that you, you live 24-7 here, a little bit from our team's pers perspective and also from the prior studies perspective. So a little bit about the design objectives, and we're going to go right into some of the options, too. Lori? Thanks. Um, my name is Lori Aho. I'm a transportation engineer with VHB. And I helped prepare some of the plans that you see up here at the front of the room. And I'm just going to talk you through some of the suggestions that we, um, so again, as we stated earlier, we took the um, study and we applied some of those suggestions um, to the corridor, and that's what you'll see here. But some of the design objectives, um, improve safety along 6A, um, sidewalk connectivity, looking at um, improving the visibility crosswalks, pedestrian accommodations, where there's area in the village center and there's enough right of way, looking at defining the parking so you don't have um, vehicles parking up on the sidewalks. So we have a very defined parking spots and very defined um, pedestrian sidewalks. Um, take a look at the signage throughout the corridor and see where um, we may need to replace or refresh it, make sure it's visible and that, but at the same time not having too many signs. You don't want too much sign, signage clutter. People tend to start ignoring signs when there's too many of them. Um, and by doing that, helping to preserve the historic context of the corridor. And again, corridor-wide, we're going to look at the um, sidewalks, just make sure that they meet current standards, ADA, um, Mass, DOT, um, that the sidewalks are access accessible to people of all users, people with carriages, people that might be in wheelchairs, walkers, so forth, and again, imp improve the visibility of the crosswalks to the vehicles so that people can see them and know that there may be people in them. Um, specific locations in the village center, we're looking at better defining the sidewalks. Um, we can do that through material types, we'll talk about that, and to reduce the long curb cuts, there's some very large driveway curb cuts and it's hard to tell what's a sidewalk, what's a driveway, and it's vehicular and pedestrian conflicts there. Um, add some additional crosswalks in the um, village center to help people that go from the um, north side to the south side. Um, at Summer Street, we just took a look at some slight tweaks in the alignment to help it make it more perpendicular and improve, um, as Trish mentioned, sight distance so that when you come up to the stop, you can see better in each direction. Um, at the Consider adding a sidewalk from the Summer Street to the post office for that desire line for people that want to walk along that stretch on the um, south side. At the Town Common, we want to look at adding a sidewalk, perhaps along the Common, because there's a lot of pedestrian traffic along there, and then putting a break into the um, fencing to allow for people to cross, um, to get into the Common from the sidewalk. And again, parking, to take a look at parking where space allows along 6A. And we also looked at some connections in the back of the parking lots. So 
we're gonna do now is just gonna go through some of the plans um, that we presented to you. Um, again, so one of the first things that we did after the, that the town of Yarmouth did in when BHB came on board, we had a um, survey go out and they surveyed the entire corridor, 6A from, actually from the Barnesville town line all the way to Union Street. And the reason they did that is so that some of these items that we're looking at um, implementing or some of these options, we need to really know what the survey looks like, what the existing conditions are, to see what kind of impact they have on the properties. Um, and how much space we have in the corridor. So some of the things they pick up existing conditions and they pick up the state right away. As we know, it's a state road and we need to know where those right away lines are. Um, so we're gonna start down to the left towards Willow Street. And the right of way in through this area is pretty much 40 feet wide. So it's 40 feet is within the state layout. And it's about, um, it's 30 miles per hour in the eastbound direction and 30 to 35 heading westbound. Um, and th this area, we're really just looking at the existing crosswalks quarter wide to see if they meet standards. And what you see in tan here is um, the area that we're looking at. For the most part, the sidewalks are just too narrow. They're not quite five feet wide. So it wouldn't be a minor, a major change. We're not looking at relocating anything. We're just looking at widening them out and making them um, accessible to all. Do you have the thing? So what we'll do here is we'll go through this. This will animate uh, going from left to right here. And I think the, one of the important parts are some of the uh, red dashed lines that show up on here as well. You can see some of the minor modifications to where the edge of pavement is uh, as we go through the corridor. So let's go for a little walk down the street. So we're getting towards the town center here. Um, as we're walking through, what you'll see here is Again, some more sidewalk suggestions. And this is where the, the right of way starts to widen out. So it goes from 40 feet to about 55 feet in front of um, Idaho. So what that allows us to do is propose some, on, you can have room for the on-street parking. So uh, as I discussed earlier, now you can better define that parking so that you know where the cars are supposed to be, where the sidewalk's supposed to be, and you don't have any um, conflicts. Um, we also, one possible location for a crosswalk might be um, to a, there's an existing one on North Sandy Side Lane, and we just talk about putting a higher visibility, which is like that piano striping you see instead of just the two lines um, that you see out there today, and then adding some wheelchair ramps on either side. And then continuing along the corridor, um, again, at Idaho, the right of way is 55 feet wide. Unfortunately, it starts to narrow back down to 40 feet, so we lose the ability to put too much um, on street parking beyond that point. But again, there's still plenty of room for some green areas and from sidewalk throughout this spot. So what we'll do now, and Evan, you can join the conversation, we're gonna take a pause here where we have the parking that's on street today um, and show you a little bit about some of the before and after images about what's out there today and how it can transform with some of these changes we've been talking about. Yeah, be, uh, real quick, Jeffrey, if you could go back to that slide, just to, uh, um, Step back real quick. My name's Evan Miller. I'm with the Landscape Architecture and Planning Group um, under Jeffrey with VHB. Um, so I've been asked to come in here and help provide a little bit of visualization as far as what some of these options may look like. Um, just at this point, it's, everything's very conceptual. Just giving you some pictures in your mind to be able to consider or reject whatever you feel comfortable. We're looking for your input on this. Um, I think another key point, like Jeffrey said, is that we're doing very minimal changes here where an edge condition uh, of existing uh, pavement may occur along in here and we're just considering making a very minor tweak to be able to help better define some of these areas. So Jeffrey, if you do go to the next slide, um, we have Hallett's store on the right over here. Um, the existing crosswalk um, that's there right now that sort of comes into a, 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 a sign opportunity here. <laughs> Acknowledging to the pedestrian in the vehicle where this occurs, but through some very minor tweaks, we may be able to, uh, Jeffrey, if you advance to the next slide, uh, be able to make that a little bit more of a prominent area or a prominent identifier to the vehicle and to the pedestrian where these things may occur. Um, the piano cr uh, striping uh, crosswalks that uh, Lori mentioned before are just a slightly higher visibility crosswalk, um, a visual, another visual indicator uh, to the vehicle that they're coming up to an area where pedestrians will be crossing uh, that mode of transportation. And, and um, Evan, I'm just gonna go back and forth a couple yeah, times. I think it might be that? helpful to see like the before and after a couple times here, especially on the first set of the series as we go through these, that we can see where some of the changes happen. 
Yeah, so a lot of what Jeffrey's going to show here is that it, it, we're, we're doing our best to maintain exactly where that uh, edge condition occurs today. Um, and what we're showing are, are a variety of options that may be considered. Um, granite curbing along an area like this allows us to do a quick vertical transfer and provide a grassed area and then a sidewalk that meets code off of that area. We ha we'll have some other options that are very that are much more indicative of the character of the Cape that would be the Cape Cod berm, which is the bituminous uh, rolled curb, uh, which we see out here a lot. Um, so that will be an option we'll go through as well. But some of the minor improvements that we've talked about are, are the curb that goes along in here to better define that edge condition. Uh, the idea of, of a grass strip or some area of buffer for the pedestrian as those vehicles move along the, the roadway. Um, a sidewalk treatment, uh, this option is showing that as concrete. Uh, as an example, uh, the accessible ramps and crosswalks. Um, the idea of uh, historic lighting. We have very high vehicular lighting that throws light at a vehicular scale along the corridor right now. One of the things that helps identify to the vehicle in the evening hours, uh, the possibility of bringing that light level down closer to where those crossings may occur. Being able to select the fixture, we're just showing one right now as a, as a more generic, what we call a historic fixture, but there are a variety of different options that can achieve that same goal that we're considering um, along in here. It also gives the opportunity to bring some seasonal color or banners or things like that to help identify that you are in a, um, a village center. Um, we're also showing a very generic feature right here right now that is a, a clock feature that may seem a little out of place, but we're using this as a placeholder to say that this may be an identifier as a spot that maybe the historic sign that's being considered may be located as you're entering into the village. So this is to, meant to be an icon of some sort to acknowledge to the vehicle and to the visitor that you're coming into a different area along the corridor. And I think it's very common at this point in the process where we're just showing you a series of images and, and materials. If you don't like the colors of the materials, there's a whole process around picking the light, the right light fixture or the right type of piano key or the right type of clock or sign there. Just think about these as ingredients that you have a lot of flexibility about the colors and the choices. And if you don't like the lights on there, that's okay. It, it can be an element that you can remove. But think about it as a kit of parts that you can have fun and play around with as well. But yeah. I think this visual also gives us the opportunity to see what that defined parking would look like um, for the vehicle as you come through here. If, if we could, if we could just save the questions to the end, we're going to try to go through this really quick. I know okay. we're, we're trying to catch up a little on time, so because there's several, several options. Just I will keep going. Well. So a lot of these, if you go back real quick, Jeffrey, this is that same condition with what's more. Um, prevalent out on uh, Route 6A, which is that rolled bituminous what, or asphalt curbing. And then we have the slightly narrower strip of grass that occurs along here because when we have granite, we can go up and back six inches and then have an area for that grass. When we do the rolled curb, um, that slope takes up an additional 18, uh, total of 18 inches along in there. So it cuts out of that grass strip slightly, but we still provide that buffer that we're considering for the pedestrians. And then there's an option, uh, again, the materiality is is up for debate, and we'll, we have a slide later on where we can, can consider these, but maximizing this as an all walkable space is another consideration that could be, um, that we can look at the ingredients and how we might uh, um, uh, pursue with that, but just the concept is, instead of having this be something that has salts uh, put on it uh, or is, um, uh, you know, dies off or has a, a maintenance level, um, if that becomes something that's all hardscape and it's usable for everybody to walk on, just in certain areas. It doesn't have to go the whole corridor, but in an area where we might have a little bit of the village center, that's something that we're trying to represent in these scenarios. And when I talked before about the great buildings, we recognize that this changes the character too. So there might be people that, that love this, or might people say that changes the character way too much. Let's just avoid brick altogether. We, we get that too. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, but uh, in reality, what we're trying to do is give some uh, better definition to some of those undefined edges that we saw in the existing slide. So um, having the center line here and two 11-foot travel lanes, um, having the minimum of a one-foot shoulder on either side, uh, and then we have this, when we do have the granite curb, we have an area adjacent to the required five-foot walks um, that uh, we can pick the type of element that goes in there, whether it be grass um, or whether it be some sort of hardscape material. Moving in a little bit closer, we can see what the um, dimensions would look like in there. 
So we've widened out the slidewalk slightly to, to the six foot sidewalk. Um, we have this edge condition, or this lane is now 12 foot, and the reason that we do 12 foot where we have a little bit more right away is the door swing for the car when they open up. We still have the 11 foot lane on this side, but we pick up another uh, foot for the door swing on that side. Um, a, an eight foot wide parking edge, and then the, the shoulders, the edge condition, and then the walks on either side as well. So we're now we're going to move forward. So we'll go through a few more of these and just give you all of the information as we go through. So we're a little bit uh, further east along the path here. Uh, we're going to move from the, the area that has the downtown parking in the village center, and we're going to work our way all the way towards Summer Street as we go off to the right-hand side. So, Laura, you want to dive sure, back in? Sure, thank you. Um, so, again, speed limits, interestingly enough, it's, um, again, 30 miles an hour heading um, eastbound, and it's 35 heading uh, westbound through this area. Um, so another possible location we're looking at this is to add a crosswalk at Happy Fish Bakery. Um, I understand that this is a well-visited um, restaurant, so I think I think a, we were thinking that a crosswalk here would um, be a great place to help pedestrians get from one side of the corridor to the other. Um, and again, it's just some cleanup um, work along here, so we're not looking at n changing um, the driveway curb cuts um, a lot in here. We're just looking at maybe using materials to define where the driveway is, where the sidewalk is, and making it um, to reduce the conflicts between the cars and the pedestrians that want to walk along the corridor. And we'll show you a detailed zoom in uh, um, before and after image of that whole area. We'll come back to that in more detail. And then I'm um, heading out of the village area. We're heading actually towards um, Summer Street. So again, the sidewalks you're seeing in through here are just some cleanup work, um, just making them wide enough to be handicapped um, to make ADA and Mass Dot access accessible. Excuse me. Um, so you can see here, as uh, we mentioned earlier, see the red line is the existing curb line, and you can see we're not really doing, we're not really revising that. It's really staying the same as what's out there today. So we're just doing some minor cleanup work. Um, replacing maybe some of the grass areas, taking a look at the, um, the curbing that's there, see if it needs to be um, replaced, and to look at the sidewalks. And then as we move along the corridor, we're approaching Summer Street. Um, speed limit through this whole intersection is 30 miles per hour both direction. Again, it's um, 40 foot right away. And all we we're showing here is Summer Street is very, very wide uh, coming out to the intersection. Um, it's a little bit of a, Potentially a safety concern for people turning in and out going a little too fast because it's so wide. So we just looked at maybe changing the geometry slightly on some of the streets is just one possible option. Um, doing some cleanup work, narrowing some of the street out a little bit, and creating some great green space um, on this corner. And uh, by doing that, it, it just improves the sidewalk and the um, pedestrian accessibility along the corridor. So everyone yeah, want to join in, so we'll show you um, an image of some of the before and afters here, knowing this is a different part of the commercial corridor, the, the businesses. Evan? Yeah, so we're going to go from the ground plane. Um, we had an opportunity and got um, approval to come and uh, run a drone out here, and so we are able to get up and get some great imagery um, all along the corridor um, to, to help us uh, catalog exactly what we were looking at. So one of the things that Lori did mention is that we do have a series of uh, drain inlets in here, and so trying to utilize and define that curb edge to to uh, take the water into the right locations is another goal of ours um, in this area as well. Um, Jeffrey, if we move to the next slide. So uh, as a potential uh, visual to what Lori was saying is, is helping to identify to the pedestrian along in here using a, a change in material exactly where that sidewalk may occur. Um, uh, right now we have a, a large open area of, of, of asphalt that as you come along here and, and you're a pedestrian, um, you sort of uh, arrive to a sea of asphalt that's fairly undefined. You don't feel necessarily protected. You feel like you're entering into the vehicle space as opposed to where a pedestrian uh, may be um, guided to move safely through the area. I'm not trying to say that it doesn't work successfully right now. I'm just throwing this out there as a concept to help consider as an, uh, an idea to meet um, some of the safety objectives that we've talked about. Um, another uh, area that uh, Lori mentioned was the crosswalk in, in this area. We're also showing a consideration, just like we've done down at the Hallett store crossing, um, 
uh, potential historic lighting or lighting of some sort where you take that high light level and you bring it down uh, for evening use at the pedestrian level um, as you move through here as well. Um, one of the other things that is a consideration at this point, though some great feedback that we received from the previous meeting, um, uh, we uh, were showing some definition to how this parking lot may work to better define where those spaces currently are. Um, having talked with some of the users and the owners in that area, um, we, we do understand that um, there is, um, th you know, the need to accommodate um, uh, ambulances and, and other types of vehicles that come to the pediatrics or how snow removal occurs along in here as well, so keeping that in the back of our mind. Right now we're showing this as a potential green strip. That could easily change to, to striping and not having a rise or a change so that flexibility may be able to be maintained, but the area is, is better identified. And that's the value of these conversations is that we have the opportunity to hear from folks about what's important to them and we may be able to meet the same objective but understanding how you use it we may change that uh, that recipe list or that, that those ingredients to get to the end objective right. so i'll move forward to the next one that shows some of the different material choices so if if that's too much in terms of a concrete looking sidewalk maybe there's other options where it stays bituminous in here as well but notice the high contrast goes away for the pedestrian in some of these areas Evan? right right so you know to jeffrey's point um there is a wonderful character around in here and we and we don't want this to feel suburban or stamped you know like it's somewhere that doesn't belong so the first palette is one option. The second palette is, is the bituminous or a slight variation on bituminous from a color standpoint. Um, and when I say bituminous, that's that, that is asphalt. It's the same material. So having an asphalt, maybe there's a slightly different color or something to that effect that helps define where that pedestrian goes. Um, it maintains that grass strip that we had in the previous. Um, this is that third scenario that we talked about on the other side of the corridor where it is maximizing the usable pedestrian space something that is appropriate down here. Uh, do we consider a hardscape material to the edge of the roadway there? It's a, it's a consideration. It's worth discussion. It's definitely just part of our, our kit of parts that we can have a discussion about later on. So a little about the dimensions, Evan? Yeah. Sure. So again, where we don't have the on-street parking in this area, we're, we're at the two 11-foot lanes with our uh, one-foot shoulders. Um, we have a varied edge condition along in here of four feet, and then the five-foot wide sidewalk is what we're proposing. Um, on this side, where we've maximized and have a little bit more volume of, of folks going to um, Happy Fish, we're showing it at a full eight-foot wide uh, pedestrian area in there. And that pedestrian area is, is nice because it gives us landing zones for that potential um, light, historic light or something like that, um, uh, a better defined area here. Um, the Summer Street area, I think um, some of our transportation engineers have, have acknowledged that that sort of wide intersection in this area and the, and the requirement to look back farther as you're approaching, especially in this condition, where if we consider some tweaks to the geometry, it may allow that to have a little bit more of a perpendicular access into this point. Um, when we did that, we, we saw that we picked up a little bit of space up in this area. One of our first things that we considered was the, the, the lack of availability for the pedestrian to sort of engage the historic trough feature on this side. We, we acknowledge that that has been there forever and <laughs> ever, right? And we wa so one option that we considered in this is to give that pedestrian an opportunity to fully visualize that. However, it, we don't have to do that. That's just a consideration. We do want to provide, the, what we noticed right now is that that trough itself, the face of it is acting as the curb, right? So we're trying to weigh what's important. That's where we want your, your feedback. So, so there's things we can do down where it is today to, to change this alignment to, and maybe just grass where we're showing that little, we call it little pocket park over there too. All that stuff is very flexible, so. Yeah, and I think one of the things we can do, consider is perhaps leaving this in this location, and then maybe there's some signage that explains what happened over here. But we utilize this, <laughs> we utilize this green space 
and talk about that the horses used to come up and, and, and water at that that those and maybe areas. that history can go decade by decade because a lot of the different things happened yeah, over has time happened over there over well. time but yeah so just trying to take uh, my job when we can when i can grab green space and make it public green space at any point as a landscape architect that's what i really try and do so um and again some of the material choices so it doesn't yeah. have to be the concrete like we're showing here it doesn't have to be granted it could be ca ca um, cape cod burn and right. asphalt as well right so just the idea of pedestrian connectivity the idea of having uh, uh, sidewalks that meet standard um, and having a, 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 an area for folks to move along as they move down to the library. Um, we're, one of the comments that we heard going through the Cape Cod report was the importance of that connectivity as it moves down here. Um, we're showing uh, the beginning of that connectivity as it moves down to the um, to the li or to um, the post office. Um, we acknowledge that there's some trees down in there too, some very important historic trees in there. So that's again where we have to weigh, do we wanna provide that connectivity at the sacrifice of possibly some of the trees that are along that area? Okay, good. Okay, uh, th that's wonderful feedback to hear, to, to, to hear, because so wh what we're trying to do is read through um, the suggestions that have come up, visualize it, allow you to see it, and see the impact and then provide feedback to us. Okay, so we just wanted to zoom in just to show you. So again, whether you like it as a green, as where the trough goes, the point is that Evan was able to, and Lori able to find this you know, unclaimed land. If you look at the size of the people in that image there too, that's a pretty significant amount of land there. So again, what, what would you like to do with it? It could all just be grass, that's okay. You can do some other things with there that might be something new that you can add to your history and your culture and your arts and how you want to celebrate it there too. But, but the point is, seize the opportunity and make it what you'd like to have out there. We put a couple of lights here. Again, think about that kit of parts, the palette you can pick and choose what you'd like to have there as well. But and, I think, and I think to your point too is is maintaining the flashing um, beacon that's out here now, bringing that up. That's one thing that I'm seeing right now that um, I wish I would have done in the in in, in the um, uh, in the graphic is is maintaining this and bringing it up to a, at a prominent spot to acknowledge that curve that's in there as well. And just a little bit on the widths here. I mean, these are very very standard dimensions: 11 foot travel lanes, 5 foot sidewalks. That's a pretty common standard that we're trying to meet throughout the corridor as well. Yep. Um, All right. So we're going to move on to the next part. So we have Summer Street at the bottom left hand. We've turned the corner a little bit. We're still obviously heading towards the east hand side here. We're going to walk from the Summer Street all the way up to the Common here. And I'll quickly zoom into where we have the next slide and, and get some of this animation going. So Lori, Lori, you want to dive back in here real quick? Sure. So um, this is the sidewalk um, that I don't think anybody seems, at least in this room, to want. But we showed it on the plan. And this is we did show the impacts. That's why, this is why we did this. This is why we got the survey, because the town wanted to know if, what would be impacted by this. So that's what we were identifying on this plan. There are a couple of trees that could be impacted if we, connectivity. I don't know where the sidewalk is that you were Oh, well, I think that we're talking about um, the, the Cape Cod um, report suggested a sidewalk from Summer Street along the south side up to the post office. Because there's nothing, there is no um, connectivity there now. So we looked at putting that in and there is a potential of a couple of, there are a couple of trees that would potentially be impacted by that sidewalk, which is what we identified on this plan and one of the reasons why we got the survey. Um, and again, if we provided that sidewalk, we would provide a new pedestrian um, crosswalk from the post office over to Thatcher Street to tie in with the um, north side of 6A and, and along here as well. So continuing along the corridor, again, what you see in here, we're not really changing the curb line or the edge line at all. We're just redefining the sidewalk to make it um, meet today's standards. So when I say that, for the most part, they're not five feet wide, and that's what um, today's standards call for is the five foot wide sidewalks, which we mentioned earlier, or they, the grading may be that they're too steep, either cross slope or up and down. So we would just redefine these to provide a um, new sidewalk. And again, bituminous, we're not looking at cement concrete here, even though they're shown, it's just shown that way for your, to show up on the screen better. Um, and then continuing further down, we would look at, um, Another a crosswalk right here, which is, this is the, um, the church, and this is the common. So this is another area we were considering putting a new sidewalk, is along the common area, because there's a lot of pedestrian and um, 
activity along here and there's a lot of activity that takes place for the town in the common area. So it was suggested that we put a, consider a sidewalk along the common and we would refresh this crosswalk that's here today with um, a, more, a higher visibility crosswalk. This is the existing crosswalk you see here and then we would look at doing the piano treatment crosswalk across the road. And then we would put in um, wheelchair ramps on both sides. And I'm just gonna back. So I think this is a good, uh, another good example where we have um, a crosswalk that ends in an inaccessible area. Um, uh, on both sides, On actually. both sides of this as well. So uh, how can we achieve uh, some of the goals of making this a true crosswalk? Um, one of the options, um, like we saw in one of the previous photographs, is to allow for the granite curbing that cur comes along in here and tapers down and gives us our uh, cement concrete landing. Um, this image happens to show cement concrete continuing down uh, just in front of the edges of the common. Um, and then on this side as well, um, showing uh, vertical granite curbing um, and bringing that sidewalk as close to the roadway uh, edge uh, of pavement as possible to maintain uh, the existing uh, fence line within the common as it currently stands today. And one um, of the standards we have to meet where the item three and number one there are when you're that close to the curb and to the roadway, you have to be vertically separated if you don't have that grass strip and enough distance behind you. So it really forces us to use that granite strip in that location because we're trying to preserve where the fence is today. That's a critical uh, design criteria. Mm -hmm. Unlike this next one, where we've actually moved the fence a little bit to accommodate different goals and objectives. So well. a different goal and objective may say that that granite curb might feel a little bit too urban and not indicative of this area. Um, in order to achieve that, we would have just the landings that would be required to be concrete and then allowing the bituminous curbing um, at the edge here, that small uh, grass strip and then bituminous sidewalk, the asphalt sidewalk, which is what we see existing out in this area um, at the back of that area. The one thing that does is the amount of space that's required to be able to get that in slightly adjusts the f current fence line location. So the existing fence line location, Jeffrey, if you can go back, comes out slightly and is in more in line with um, the um, sign that's right here um, by doing that slightly wider adjustment to accommodate um, the Cape Cod berm, that edge condition moves back in just slightly to be able to accommodate the sidewalk in front of the common. So again, that's where we're weighing those different material choices and what are the goals that we're trying to do here? How can the look change? Um, and uh, we'll be you know, open for discussion. Uh, the final um, exhibit in this area um, takes out the grass along the edge here and maintains that alternate material um, along the edge condition um, between the sidewalk and the face of curb in this area. So the dimensions, Evan? Yep. Yeah, so just real quick, um, our dimensioning that we do have out here, again, we're at those 11 foot travel lanes, our one foot required shoulders, um, the three foot worth of um, ramp and then the landing that comes into the five foot area here. Uh, the tip down here, uh, you would come in at a level condition and then you would have a six foot wide sidewalk that ramps up in either direction here. Um, so you don't need that rise along in here that we're showing within that three foot zone. That actually all occurs within the sidewalk edge right down in there. Thank you. So we have the last two sections. There's no animations that go with these other than just showing you a little, really simple, simple part of the whole corridor as well. So uh, Lori, I'll dive right into these and we'll work our way around the bend from the common all the way around. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Um, so right in here, this is Trust Street. This is the wall. The existing wall is here today and the sidewalk that we um, talked about earlier that we may, that it is part, it's not, it doesn't meet standard today. So we consider potentially um, some improvements there to make that handicap accessible. There's an existing crosswalk that's located here at the library. We're just looking at refreshing that with a um, piano key um, type crosswalk or some other treatment to make it more visible and to provide wheelchair ramps on either side of that. Um, again, looking at the existing sidewalk along here, find out where it doesn't meet standard and then just replacing it with either a wider sidewalk or one that matches cross slopes. And again, as we pointed out earlier throughout here, um, we're not really changing the curb line out here. We're pretty much keeping it continuous and match what's out there today. 
Um, something that we mentioned earlier is some of the driveways are really wide open. Um, one example of that is um, at the village store here. It's a great um, store, but there is no real defined sidewalk. Again, we're going to we're just looking at providing a defined sidewalk area to help separate vehicles um, from pedestrians, so that pedestrians know where they can safely cross these wide open driveway areas. And Lori, that's a great example where should this continue down to be further designed in the next couple of years, you'd work with property owners to understand the operations, the ins and outs, and, and this would be refined to reflect all of those specific site by site needs as well. Lori? Yep, and then and again another potential area for um, wheelchair ramps and crosswalk is from the uh, church over to the village store area. And then moving moving east to on the quarter, it's actually the speed limit up into here gets pretty fast. I, I think we're in the 40 mile an hour range, so I'm just keeping that in mind. Um, again, just looking at the existing sidewalks and replacing or um, winding them out where need be because they don't meet standard. Then potentially adding a new crosswalk at Homestead Lane, again with the piano key treatment or some other high visibility crosswalk and the uh, wheelchair ramps. Okay, and this is the last section that we're gonna go all the way down towards the end of the corridor here as well, and we'll go right into the, the animation from the left to right, Lori? Yep, again, and continuing easily heading towards Union Street. Um, again, we're not really looking at changing the edge line, maybe some new striping, um, and taking a look at the existing sidewalks again to and replacing them with um, sidewalks that meet current standards. And again, the right of way with through here is about 40 feet wide, so you're li we're limited on how much we can really um, provide in these areas. So we would just look at taking the HMA and replacing it with new HMA sidewalks and maintain the grass strips that are out there today. What's HMA? Sorry, Sorry. HMA is the hot mix asphalt. It's the, it's the pavement um, that, that's out there today. Bituminous is another word for it. Sorry, MassDOT used to call it bituminous and then they changed it to HMA and sometimes um, I forget to convey that. So. Um, again, traveling um, east along the corridor. Say we're really not we're not even um, considering anything but just sidewalk improvements in through here. And then as we come to the um, limits here, sorry, this is a slow animation through here. <laughs> I gotta start talking pace, really so. slow. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're almost here. here we go. So a little more, so down through here, there's a playground. Um, so just suggested adding, there's an, just adding a ladder crosswalk, a higher um, visibility crosswalk in through here, and as well as a crosswalk acro um, across playground lane. So that, that brings us to the end there, and I think we only have like one or two more slides here where we'd just like to talk to you about, you know, he, um, materials, right? And um, th this is where a lot of communities have fun making sure that these materials speak to your character, your identity. So we intentionally put up a range of materials here. It's okay that you don't like any of them. It's okay if you like some of them. The, the, the point is, a lot of the first phase of this would go through what we call like geometric improvements. So like where where's technically the sidewalk have to be? What are the dimensions? Are the curbs and the, and the berms in the right place? You kind of get that locked in. Then you come back, and I think where some of the fun part happens is, where do you want to have certain materials? Where do you want to keep it really, really simple? Or maybe where do you want to have a little bit of punch to some of these locations? So we just want to share with you some other communities, what they're doing in terms of, in terms of their material choices. Evan, you want to talk a little about this? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think, you know, selection of materials when we do get to that point, like Jeffrey said, is, is what can really make a community feel like home. Right, so not borrowing materials that don't match the the, uh, the current conditions, I think, is a huge thing. But just uh, so the intent of this slide is just to show that there is a whole variety of options to consider um, as we do this. Um, you know, stone that could be, um, uh, you know. Um, you know the granites that are that are um, in the area. Um, there's um, the opportunity to get uh, concrete that has shell. Uh, seashells that are crushed up in them um, as what your aggregate is. So instead of just a standard stone aggregate, you can you can get shells within that. And I've reached out to a vendor um, at the suggestion of, of uh, one of the folks in the room here to try and get a sample for our next meeting uh, so you can actually see what that looks like. Um, 
when we say bituminous, asphalt, or HMA, um, that is something that can also be stamped and colored. Um, so something that may look like a cobble or something different that might be something that's um, that same material but have a different look than just standard driveway. Um, a variety of different type of seating options, a variety of different type of lighting options, um, a variety of different type of signage options that can all be considered. So hearing what's important to you um, is what will make this page even more specific to Yarmouth. So with that, um, really the, the rest of our time tonight, I know there's a lot to digest there too. I know we took a little bit more time than we thought that we would too, but I think it was important to give you as much information we have. That's as detailed as it is. There's, it's not like there's all, the, all these other drawings that we've done. This is very conceptual. By the time you get done through all the design documents, it's an inch thick worth of drawings and details and specifications. That stuff comes later. We just really, really just want to make sure we're on the right track, the right concept, so the town can figure out how best to move forward. So thinking about some of the design features, you know, parking, for example, should it be on one side, both sides? That, that width is really, really tight. And those ideas about m defining who should be where for the right reasons, love to hear your comments on that. You know, the curb cut issues and how we're maybe necking down a couple places to get the, the high visibility connections across on the crosswalks across, very important. Some of those geometric changes, especially around Summer Street, that's probably the biggest geometric change we put in the whole corridor. Like, is that important for some of the, the those reasons and the opportunities we discovered as, as well? Choosing materials, again, I think that comes a little bit later, but now, feel free to give us some feedback about some of the things you don't like or, or like. Setting priorities. Sometimes these projects have to be phased over time as well, or maybe you cert like certain areas and don't like other areas. Let us know. And just general feedback. And what we thought we'd do is just before we go into the Q&A, tell you a little bit about next steps. So really um, developing a preferred concept. Again, a concept plan, very preliminary, that would come out of this process. Um, we have our public meetings that we're um, uh, in the middle of. We have one more coming up next week on the 22nd. The idea would come back and present the preferred concept concept to the public again, get more feedback, give that to the town. Think about construction cost estimates and those things. It's always helpful to think about the price, the, who, who's going to pay for what, what are, the, what are the dollars and cents. Um, evaluate funding opportunities. A lot of communities think that maybe we can pay for itself, maybe we need to go out and get some funding. What are the sources that are out there as well? And maybe a preliminary meeting with MassDOT to get their initial buy-in about some of these issues. We talked a lot about standards today, and actually to do some of the things we're talking about, you'll probably need some variances because we're trying to keep it simple in certain locations, like sidewalks on both sides versus one. You might need to have some variances here. So going to them and saying, look, we might need to get some exemptions to some of this stuff. Is here's the reasons why the community is really preferring some of this direction. So that initial meeting will really, really be helpful in as well. So what we thought we'd do is go back and really take our way through each of those four or five sections. We'll spend as much time as we want on each of those, about maybe 10 to 15 minutes at most on each of those. Fill up the, the, uh, the comment list up here as well and really hear th from you for the rest of the evening. So if I could have us join here as well, and I think what we'll do is I'll go back to the beginning here and we can start uh, answering a lot of your questions, okay? And I think what we do for the folks at home, I'll come around with a microphone. If you could just let us know where you're from, capture this so people can hear us at home as well, all right? Jeffrey, do you want to work the yes, board I'll and I'll that? take the yeah, mics around? Yep. I'll go back up to You'll you. probably need that mic to respond. All right, uh, do we have any uh, comments or concerns? I know there's gonna be some questions out there, so we'll just start around here and, and uh, we'll let you uh, speak into the microphone and we'll start the dialogue. Okay. Hi, uh, Bob Dunnan, uh, Route 6A, 318, Route 6A. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about at all that wasn't even brought up was the uh, fire station. Um, I'm uh, a few doors down from the fire station and uh, there isn't a day that goes by where there aren't 10 or 15 uh, you know, calls that these guys go out. And I'm wondering about, does that change what we can use for curbing? Because people have to get over to the side, obviously. If they have a granite curb, they can't get up on the curb. 
Right now, 6A is a lot like you see on the on the present uh, picture here. It's uh, there's no curbing whatsoever, and people can easily get off. And uh, I was curious to know. Um, the width of the road, what we can, you know, have, have, have you guys talked to the police and EMT and fire to see what they say about curbing and things of that nature? So, um, can anybody hear me? Yeah. So, we haven't, we will, that's part of the process and it's part of the design process, so that's why we talked about all the different types of materials here. Um, we would always meet with not only the town, but the fire, the police departments, and discuss with them what materials they would like to use. So um, yes, we would review that with them. And th th we brought it up at the last meeting, potential of maybe even using like a sloped granite or you know, using the bituminous berm. But we would go, we would speak to all those, emer you know, emergency response vehicles are the most important, you know, they have to be able to access. Um, so we would talk to them about it. Yeah. Um, one of the things. Really yeah, honest. it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we really would consider is just granite curbing where there's a pedestrian crossing or wheelchair ramps. Um, along the entire corridor, the idea is not to put granite curbing in because of the narrowness of the roadway. So that is something that we already are um, considering because emergency, like Larry had said, emergency access is, is the number one important thing besides you know plowing and maintenance and all that stuff. So we want to make sure that you know, the response time main is maintained or improved, or, you know, if there is a car parked, that there's enough room for an emergency vehicle to get around them. And in conjunction with that, going eastbound from the, uh, the yeah, uh, in conjunction with what you said, going eastbound from, uh, let's say, Church Street, um, is there gonna be any consideration for curbing of any kind? Uh, there. Uh, only at wheelchair ramp locations. So the, the, the oh, curbing So it's going to be as is, like you see in the picture here? Yeah, but in the village area, because we are doing curb extensions and defining where the parking is, areas like that would be considered f uh, a consideration for granite curbing. But along the corridor itself, outside of the village area, it would not be No curbing. curbing. Right. Okay. Only where there was a sidewalk that's next to... It would be bitume, it would be a berm. It would be a sloped edging. Or okay, a sloped so berm like. Okay, so, so there would be curbing. It wouldn't uh, be curbing. Uh, it would be mountable. Mountable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think we're going to try to see if we can stay in the village center just to kind of get some general feedback about here. If that's what right. you would like. Yes. I'm Judy Nauer. I live on Sandy Side Lane, right, <laughs> right where we try and cross on the crosswalk there just yesterday, even with the improved signage, a car stopped for going westbound. Four cars went right through the, um, so I'm highly in favor of having very visible crosswalks <laughs> in all the places you mentioned. The other thing I would say, I like the idea of some sort of alternative material next to the sidewalk, because visually, I think that really helps people coming into this higher density area to realize something different is going on. I need to be more alert because people come roaring up and, you know, suddenly they're at the crosswalk and they don't have that ability. And also, I love the bringing the lighting down and putting in something historic along there. So one of the things, just to follow up with you, thank you very much for your input. One of the things that we were considering is um, a historic plaque that is almost like a gateway feature so that people understand that it's a pedestrian location, it's a sense of place. It so that would be something. needs to be before you yes. hit yes. this yes. area. Yeah. Right. That's correct. Yeah, the comment was that it needs to be before you hit this area. So it's the precursor that sets the stage and then you have time to react. You're not just all <laughs> coming up on it at once. Hi, I'm Melanie Barron, uh, 111 Route 6A. So I am right after the zooming around the curve. And I'm uh, disappointed and don't understand, I know you said it, but I don't get it. The two biggest traffic things are Willow hitting 6A and the turn from 6A going west down uh, Station Avenue, Union Street. I can't get out of my own driveway right. in the summer. Right. I know, because 
i have to go to the right even though if i want to go to the left and i have to wait sometimes ten minutes in the summer just to get out of my own driveway right and and um, which is not defined yes um, we heard that at last week's meeting also that there are safety issues at those specific locations um, what the town was doing was advancing the 2017 study of the Route 6 corridor that was just inside of those two intersections and are going to be looking as a different alt um, a, a initiative to take a look at those two intersections. Hi, my name's Tom Martin from Village Lane. Uh, the sidewalk, I mean the crosswalks. I'm sure you folks are familiar with the new technology they have that's available that gives the driver an idea that the crosswalk is actually raised about an inch and a half. Have you seen that technology? Yeah. Optical yep. Illusion. Optical illusion, exactly. And I would love to see that impl implemented in, in your, uh, your work. The only thing, Tom, is everybody knows it's an optical illusion now. The cat's out of the bag. Yeah, but the tourists, the tourists don't know it, kid. The tourists don't know it. They think, they think we're still 1639 here. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mariana Gresti, and I um, am a resident of Yarmouth. I do not live here in the village, but I am president of the board of directors of the Preservation Foundation that owns the new church. Um, and so I would have a lot of concerns about these features that I consider. I should also tell you that I'm an architect, so I, I do see a lot of the things, and, and frankly, I do believe that everybody sees them, not just engineers and architects. I think that we see that differently. <laughs> um, but I feel like these moves, because they are standards, which you, a word you used repeatedly, um, standardize this place as a result of that, right? And, um, and, and so we have to figure out a way with all the talent in this room and all the talent between you guys to make this safer and apply the standards that we know exist. But if we apply the same standards to every place all over the United States, it's all gonna look like Mashpee Commons. And, and that's what it looks like to me. So um, I have a question because this is a standard I actually don't know about. The requirement to raise the curb, we understand that to be safer because pedestrians understand their place. You all said repeatedly about placemaking for one or the other and clarification, all these things. Part of the beauty is that it isn't that structured, right? And so by, by insisting that we say, no, you go there, dogs go there, cars go there, you have taken away the sort of rural flow, right? The horizontal flow. So. Um, what, in an effort to sort of, main, wh wh the problem is it hasn't really been maintained, right? Some of these edges have simply not been maintained. I mean, you've said repeatedly that you're not changing the curb edge, but honestly, by raising it eight inches, you are changing the curb edge. You can't show as a plan with a red dashed line, raise it eight inches in section and tell us you're not changing it. So could just stop saying that because it kind of like makes it really upsetting every time you say that. <laughs> so. Um, so why do we have to raise that curb edge? If we define it with material change, can we somehow sort of, is there actually a, a, a um, regulation that requires that the curb be a certain height um, when you change from pedestrian to parking? So um, it's called the Ashto Roadside Design Guide, and there is a vertical clearance that's required if you have a sidewalk that's right next to a roadway itself, and it's not eight inches. Um, it does vary. Some towns like to have seven inches just for maintenance purposes, so whenever they overlay the roadway, they can keep overlaying it without bringing the, the pavement down, and then they, c they can raise it up so mm. that there is still a barrier. Um, in a pedestrian area like this, there is a... a a distinction that you would want to have a defined edge so that people understand where the pedestrian use is versus We're smart, the we get that. Yeah. We, we don't need like eight inches high. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you. There is some philosophy in more urban areas where it's all on the same plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, I don't remember the, shared street. I would not recommend it in this area because it's, it's, it's not like a, a, a center or a gathering place, it's, it's a linear corridor. So. If you had everything on the same plane, then there would be no protection for not only just you know where the pedestrians go and the cars go, but also where the, the buildings are and the, the private properties adjacent to it. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. Um, I just as a last comment, please um, the brick 
um, I find, particularly in front of the new church, I need to speak, um, I would consider that to be very, very inappropriate in front of the, that whole common area. It, it, again, it, it suburbanizes the whole space and, and, and sort of reeks of, of development. Can I just take that sure. Hi. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> My name is Diana Braggington Smith. I live in the village. My dad was Jack Braggington Smith. I grew up in the village, walking this street pretty much every day. So I have a lot more than a casual relationship with it. Um, I'd like to start, if you'll all indulge me, I have a letter here from the last time a lot of these things were proposed from Mr. Ben Muse, who was an honored member of our village. And this was something that he proposed, and it, it's in keeping with what Marianne said. I understand about improving things, but if you look behind you there, 1639. You can't bring 1639 to code and keep 1639. You have a historic responsibility to do better than, than what I'm seeing here. And what Mr. Muse said is, I've been reading a book by Claire Layton, who lived in Wellfleet, entitled Country Matters, which speaks to this matter as forcefully as anything I have heard. And here's the quote. If I am defiant in my defense of countryside, it is because I know it to be the last hope of sanity. Here in the heart of the laboring man is the strong, sane humor of the earth, without which there is no health. At no time has this been more needed, and at no time have we stood a greater risk of losing it. For with the modern rush of consciousness about the country, we may destroy the thing we love. A sentimentalized, self-conscious countryside, fixed for the sightseer, would have lost all that made it desirable. And that is exactly what Marianne is speaking to here today. And I can't state strongly enough that I get the improvements are necessary, but I don't really see what the major problem is in our village except for cosmetic and s some structural safety issues. I don't see who's really in danger at the moment of not knowing where the street is and where the sidewalk is. I've lived here all my life. I don't see people wandering around, touching it on the ground like this, going, can you find it, Ethel? I don't know where it is. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Sure. It's just gotten a little out of control with, with the definitions, and you're losing the quaintness of the village, in my opinion. Thank you. Lee Rowley, um, I don't live in a village, but I drive through it quite a few times every day. And um, one of the things that's probably most notable is the telephone poles. They're too close to the edge of the road. They've been hit numerous times, as you can see. And it really makes sense in some areas, like in your village, where you could put these wires underground. I know it's expensive, but it's been done in other villages like this, and it really makes for a great improvement. And it saves the trees. And save the trees. It, uh, you just put, a do uh, put, some, put a duck bank in the ground mm -hmm. and uh, put enough ducks for future and put all the wires on the ground. And I'm not saying for the whole length, mm -hmm. but the village. in the village area in particular. The other, the other issue um, that I wanted to ask <laughs> is in the area of where the old Lyme Inn, uh, I mean the old Yarmouth Inn, excuse me, you wanted to put a sidewalk through there. I know some, some big trees. Have you considered acquiring a right-of-way, an additional right-of-way, where you can move the sidewalk around the trees? And in some cases, maybe even, maybe you don't have to acquire the roadway right away, but um, just get an easement from the property owners, adjacent property owners. And that would solve the problem of getting the sidewalk from Summer Street 
to uh, the post office. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, that is an option. That's why we, again, had the survey done, marked out where the right of way was, so that we knew what it would take to implement some of the changes, see what those impacts are, and then and that, that we can definitely go and um, I guess it would be the town would have to speak to the property owners to see if that's something that they would consider. Yeah, but it yes. may not be all that expensive. I mean, they may be able to just get an agreement you know, they might be able to, the town may be able to do some, some kind of a co additional accommodation for that, that right. property. And again, but again, it gets more complicated because it's state controlled right away. And unfortunately, the state doesn't allow for easements. They usually make acquisitions. So we would have to, again, they'd have to agree, make an agreement with the property owner on that. But okay. it's something we could definitely look at. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I live off. Okay, I live off of Old Church Street, and if I want to walk from Old Church Street up to the library or into the village, I have to walk on the street because of the landscapers, who we have a Cape Cod berm all along there. So if you put the regular side sidewalks there, then I'd be able to walk. It's terrible, and they don't move, they don't go down the side streets, nothing. So that's one of my concerns is, I know the lady in front there is an architect, and I love the town. I've been on the Cape since 1954, and I've moved from different places, and I do love Yarmouth Port. But the thing is, you, you put your life in your hands when you walk along there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I was just curious in all the accident reports, how many of it w were um, hitting telephone poles? <laughs> <laughs> These were the actually. Oh, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to share your experience? <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for the telephone pole, more cars than several would have crashed into the front of my house. Um, oh. So the accident data that we collect, I, I just took a look at the totals. We can have the breakdown of them to see whether or not they did collide with the utility pole. Was it another vehicle? <laughs> Was it a pedestrian or a cyclist? So I can get the breakdown. I can give it to the town so that they can post it on the website. And when will you get that time? Um, next week. It's, it's, it's available data that's on the MassDOT website, and I'm happy to. To provide that to Kathy. Uh, my name is Paul Orvis. And, uh, we, we live at 152 Route 6A. And in addition to um, the, I mean, considering the, the curb cut versus the bituminous uh, curbing, uh, it's not just uh, residential automobiles that come through there. And obviously, we have to you know, make accommodations for the emergency vehicles. But there's a significant number of landscapers, as you suggested, UPS drivers, FedEx drivers, US mail. Um, uh, delivery trucks that, that are you know, in the co more commercial area that use the front uh, parking area as the place to stop, either for five minutes or the entire day. Builders also uh, use that. Um, and you know, I just wondered how you factor that into the planning. You know, of, of saying, you know, gosh, you know, it's great that we're creating a bituminous uh, curbway, which is better for dr cars driving along. They don't get you know flat tires by running into a, a cold curb. Uh, but at the same time. Those people are going to gain access to that and take access to that of that that sidewalk, and it's it's a factor in the planning process. And I wondered how you address that, at both at the local and the state level. Um, well, one way is we could put up no parking signs uh, in the state layout. That's one option, um, and and, and it, that becomes an enforcement issue. Unfortunately, it would just have to be have to work with the town and make sure, or the state, and make sure that it's, that those no parking is enforced. Um, you know, and we could talk about materials, but again, we've heard both sides. Some people know there's a lot of no granite curb and prefer a bituminous berm, but again, that's why we're here to ref to talk to everybody and get everybody's input and see what works best along the corridor for everybody. I gotcha. It's me. It's coming in from behind. Here you go. Sorry. <laughs> it's me again. Hi. I um. Just to, I love Happy Fish. I go there all the time when I can. It's open 
three days a week, four days a week, right. short hours. The problem with the parking is not happy fish, it's in a hoe. I sometimes cannot walk home except at night, except on the street, because there are so many cars parked up on the sidewalk all along I'm um, this side of, of Hallett's and the cars are all the way down. But behind the buildings, people don't realize it, there's an enormous amount of parking, especially at the bank and the ex-bank and Jack's, because they're closed at night. But people, if you don't know, you don't know that you could park in the back and get off the street. That's a, that's a great comment. We actually heard a little bit about that last week, too. The idea that um, parking is obviously very precious in any village center that you go to, but the signage and the wayfinding done at the right scale and character is really important to better advertise what's supposed to be happening. And I fully, I fully get people's preferences about parking in front, going in really quick, and coming back out. But the parking behind becomes really critical. There's many communities that have actually looked at their zoning bylaws, their parking bylaws, to try to find ways to add more flexibility about how those things happen to the point that they'll do studies to see how you can share some parking behind some of those buildings. Completely up to the landowners, completely up to the tenants, but the idea of improving the performance, improving the signage, goes a long way towards solving some of those problems, especially if there's capacity in some of those lots in different times of the week, days, weekends, that may open up some opportunities. I think there was some interest as we were walking around and talking to folks about trying to find some subtle ways of some connections that might open up some of those opportunities as well. So very, very good comment. So let's go back through here as well. Hi, I'm Betty Lentel. I'm one of the owners at Barfield's Lamp Shop, which is one of the places where you're talking about taking out our parking spaces and getting rid of them and with curb cuts and a couple of things. One, there's only two places in town that really have parking issues and those are Happy Fish pretty much and um, Eno. Those are the biggest, you know, problem areas and both of those places have huge parking lots out back but neither one of them has any signage really that allows people to know where that parking is or to know that they're supposed to utilize that parking. So therefore, they park on the street um, or in our parking lot. Um, and there's a huge amount of parking up by the bank, mm -hmm. but the one property, not the bank, but the other one that is privately owned doesn't allow anyone else to park there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> or walk there or breathe there, but <laughs> maybe there's a way that the town could approach those owners for their huge parking lot that never has a car in it to possibly see if there would be a way to lease their parking, provide insurance for them, if we could utilize that parking for the village some way that could eliminate part of and the biggest problems that we have in the village with the parking and then people feeling like they can't walk along the sidewalks because of the parking issues. Um, because just as a, one personal thing, and I know this only affects us and nobody else, but when you take away one of our five parking units in our building that has no other parking available and we have four commercial units and you take away our fifth parking lot space, you have just impacted the value of my property significantly. And I just bought that property <laughs> based on having those number of parking spaces. So that is a huge impact to me personally besides those curb cuts and I know no one likes it when cars turn there and trust me it's in my parking lot I of anyone knows the amount of people that turn there every day and pull into my parking area but there are very few signs or places where people know they can turn around, such as the bank parking area or any of that. So they see a big open spot and they use that to turn. And that includes UPS, FedEx, 
every truck delivering to Happy Fish, even though they have a U turn area that they can utilize for their, you know, commercial trucks. So I think there's ways to do what everybody's talking about that maybe don't have to be, you know, as they were saying, the granite curbing and changing the whole character of the village. Thank you. Hi, Krishna Sprinkle, 180, Route 6A. I'm directly across from Briar Patch Pediatrics, and it is a it's basically a rotary. I mean, it's constantly people coming in and out of there. But um, I would disagree about Happy Fish because often if I'm work walking during the day with my dog, I'm trying to get down the sidewalk, I can't get between the cars in the hedge to get down the sidewalk. I have to go out into the road. And cars are parked on both sides. If they open, some of the cars are actually parked in the road on the side of Happy Fish. So it's, I, I would say that is a definite hazard. Mm -hmm. um, and and we're, it, so I also just want a second um, utilize, fully utilizing the parking, lo parking that is available behind um, the, the businesses. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go down the village to the common, <laughs> and I just had a, a question or a comment about the relationship between the um, the fence in the common and maybe the proposed sidewalk. So there were two options. One was to go through the fence, and I think they've already sort of taken a little piece of that out, so we can sort of, it's just not aligned. Um, but I wonder, you know, a, a sidewalk like that, the question with these sorts of sidewalks is, um, once you end the sidewalk, where are you, right? And so to sort of invest in that sort of sidewalk and to encourage people to sort of hang there actually seems like more trouble yeah. than actual safety, because they're, they're on the wrong side of the fence, but they're on a sidewalk. How did the, if it's a handicapped accessibility issue, how did they get there in the first place, right? Because there's really um, not a way to sort of safely kind of get to those sidewalks. So I would ask you to kind of, again, think less about the standards and that and look at the reality of the place. Um, and um, we know from having events there, you know, we hire crossing guards so people cross safely to come through there. We want people to land on the other side of the fence, right? So if we're going to make a, a safe place for people to walk left or right, let's get them safe before they walk left or right. So I would encourage th considering that. And now I know that you've limited yourself to the land that you've been allowed to design on and you've been given a boundary, and I get that. But like these other suggestions, the only way this is really going to work is if you work with your partners and colleagues and think outside of that. So to your point, it may be that we install, oh, I'm sorry, can I use the right real quick? Uh, to your point, maybe what we do is we just simply install the crossing area and the landing that's all accessible now, and then not consider any uh, of the other adjustments. Perhaps, yeah, yeah, exactly. That it brings you in to the opening at a safe into the park, and then the park can move from there. Maybe. Um, but I would also say that as you develop this, there's an opportunity here to make this seem less like a mall and more like a historic significant place. And that um, we know the parameters geometrically of what needs to happen and we get that, but there's no reason that um, we couldn't um, bury that in something that doesn't look like it is a shopping mall, right? So this is basically the foreground of one of our most historic buildings in town. So um, we might need to think about this being special and not like the exact solutions in the village. Um, I also wonder, you said that you would move the fence, not move the fence. I mean, there's a, a change in grade there, right? I mean, so no wonder what happens. You'd have to regrade and pick the fence up, yeah. That moves back in is to get not only the area to put that development or the construction, but then the side slope. Yeah. Right, but but that there's an opportunity there to really think about how that feels. So um, the common feels like part of the historic buildings, right? There's a real opportunity there. So I would encourage the town to to look at that carefully. And that's a good point. And something else that we also heard was that there's no sidewalk from here down. That's what we're trying to say. It's a dead end. Right. To so one one person saw, asked if there was any way of putting a sidewalk in here. But what can we, what, what, I mean, I'm just. I mean, th these are fair comments, right? right. So that's why we're here listening. So right. But we have to also share uh, what other folks have said at the same time. Yeah, 
I, again, there's other folks that had a desire to say like, well, how can we get connected on this side too? And if, and, and if that happens on this side, yeah, then what would happen is maybe there'd be a crosswalk here too. It doesn't have to happen though, right? It's, it, that's why we're here tonight to talk about these options. And I think really there is a lot of flexibility in this here too. Like these colors, I mean, th maybe there's something that you do differently there. It doesn't have to have the sidewalk that comes around the end. We notice that obviously the fence goes all the way down to the back of the common here too. So when people are parking down the common here and they want to be able to walk in the, the gate, the, um, the gaps and coming into the church and so forth, we thought maybe there's a desire to be able to bring people around the corner to where they're parking. You don't have to do that either though. It was just things for you to react to. Totally, totally options. Yeah, much, much more they can do it inside too. That, that's fine too, right? So yeah, let's, let's keep going. More, the more comments, the better. So who was up next? The other? Yeah, in uh, sir. I got a question on Summer Street. I live directly across from. Sir, can I hand that to you? Thank you. Scott Johnson. I live directly across from Summer Street 212. You know, uh, it's got a nice open feel to it right now. It seems like you know you've closed it up quite a bit there. Yep. And. Uh, Pointed all the traffic directly at my house, kind of. You know? <laughs> are there, there going to be other options here? Or? <laughs> 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 this is just one option, and yeah. the reason we looked at this was because it's it is a wide open area, and what happens is that when people, um, I have a tendency. I'm not going to speak for everybody else, but when I have a lot of pavement, I'm going to take that corner really fast because I can. Right. So it's just it's a way of traffic calming, slowing people down. And providing a more perpendicular so that instead of flaring out, bring someone in here so that they have better sight to see people obstructing. Is that the only fix? No, not at all. It's just, just again, we just want to bring possible options for people to comment on and okay. get it. My point on that, though, can, is can we make sure we do just one at a time and make sure we there's a there's a person in the back of the raising hand. Yeah, I know. So let's we'll cover them around with the mic too. It's, it's everyone at home can hear as well. Yeah, were you finished, sir? Too? Do you have yeah. another comment? Okay. Excellent. Do, Evan, why don't we finish? There's a piggyback um, comment on this one, and then we'll come around the back. Just because the way that works, um, when you take that left off of 6A, if you're going down Summer Street, you, oh, where am I now? Okay, so if you're coming in front of Paranassus and you're taking that left, people don't come all the way up here and go left. They, they take it further in. So what you're doing more so is you're creating a stop on that corner that's going to require people to come up and stop and turn. Actually, that it's very dangerous coming around the corner. Well, yeah. it isn't actually. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come it's, around it's a, the mic. It's a double-edged sword yeah. because what, what happens there is you're changing the flow or the way that works. The reason it's a, a V as it is now is because when it's, it's, there isn't a lot of visibility and there isn't a lot of room. When people are making that, that corner, they're making it there because you can't see. If you come further up, someone could be right there. I just think you're going to end up creating a situation where you're going to need a, a stoplight or an intersection there because if you're bringing people up that high, you're bringing them well past the point that they can pause and go. They're at the point where they're stopped and locked up, and that's not a stop spot. That's a curb on a main road. There's no stop. Like, Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's it's dangerous place to stop your car. Is all I'm saying. You're changing the flow of traffic there. Let, let's work our way down through the back again. Yeah. So we, I understand. Um, th there's a lot. There's a lot um, going on here, right? Uh, a lot. Remember that uh, image that Trish showed with the big um, blowing up symbol there, all the crashes and so forth. But I think p part of what you can do is you can weigh some of these trade-offs in terms of do you want to put a little more space back for the pedestrian or not. When you're thinking about the cars that are coming through, you're talking about this movement through here, having to come up high enough and then turn at a more and come in that way, right? So what that what that does is it actually cues up intersections. If you go down the rest of the corridor, most of them come in at a 90 degree perpendicular access point. Part of the issue that's going on here is when the cars are going this way, they're already turned on maybe a 30 or so degree angle. They're having to look back over their shoulder and beyond to see what's happening this way. So while that might be, so that might be, challenging this way too, what it's also doing is coming in and trying to fix that on that side as well. These are all things that we're throwing on the table to say that we're trying to fix it from multiple perspectives, not just one. So that, that's... So I have a perspective too, yep. I live on that street, <laughs> yes. and I, I don't know how this works. It was fine, just keep going. I live on that street. If you can hold it I take that turn many times a day. I 
Diana makes an excellent point, and I don't think what you're considering when, when you speak of the perpendicular. So I thought it was going to be that guy's house with the headlights. This is on an incline. Yep. So it, this is not a grade crossing that's level. So you need that space to make the turn, not only coming into Summer Street, but exiting Summer Street. I bicycle. I bicycle to the shore. Mm -hmm. When I come home, if I'm coming from the church, where that white car is, and I have to make my move to get into Summer Street, and a car is coming from the west, from the west, headed east, No. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that we're, and, and feel free, Kathy or others from the time if you want to join in here, but I, I mean, I don't think it's intended to be a, a vote and a process. This is more of a conversation to get feedback to figure out what comes next, right? That's. Kathy, I think one of the things that we're finding here um, in, in the feedback, which is excellent, it's great that it's different and people have different ideas. That's what we were looking for. I'm not exactly sure what the consensus is on, on what improvements we would make. I think because we don't have a general consensus, I don't see how we can come up with a preferred concept, and this is just me speaking out loud for the first time to the group, um, but I think it might be a case of going back before the Board of Selectmen and saying, this is the information we received. We need some, some input from you guys on, on how you might wish to proceed. Um, it would always need some type of vote that would have to happen. If the, any town funds were going to be utilized in this, it would require a town meeting vote. Um, so we have a long way to go before we ever get to, to a point like that. The whole issue of uh, having to deal with mass DOT and Route 6A State Highway, that's a huge nut to crack unto, its, unto itself. So if this is a case where the general public's like, you know, we don't really hate it that much. We're really looking for maybe some enhanced maintenance. Um, uh, maybe there's a couple areas that need to be fixed because we have some drainage issues or something. Maybe that's the project that we get out of all of this. Maybe it isn't anything in the, in the village center. Maybe we're not changing the geometry at Summer Street. This is the input that we're looking for. And I think I think there's a few more comments in the, were you, were you all set, sir, in the back? I just want, didn't want to cut you off there. Yeah. So I think there's a few in the middle, Evan, that we missed as well. If you, uh, Could you hold one second, sir? I think, yeah, I mean, if you could push the button on the bottom of that mic, I think it got turned off by accident. Is that on? Hey, there we go. <laughs> to take one to the, okay, uh, we live right across from the pediatrician's office, but at what does, uh, you're talking about so many different things that um, have to uh, meet guidelines from DOT. At what point do you trigger um, DOT regulation? I mean, because pr uh, years ago, we didn't have a sidewalk. I mean, it was it was worthless. And it, actually, a young boy was killed on a bicycle, which which triggered us to get the sidewalk we have now. Um, but that was done as a repair, right. so that we didn't um, trigger uh, all this oversight and regulations. Um, so uh, I, a lot of the things that I hear people talking about tonight, I think, could be addressed as repairs. Um, so at what point, uh, I guess my question is, at what point do you trigger the DOT coming in and say, no, you can't do that, this landing pad for this crosswalk has to be eight feet wide and six feet deep made out of such and such material. Right. <laughs> I, I, I worked on, uh, for uh, an architectural firm in Boston and we worked on Beacon Hill and uh, the landing pads were an argument for 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, it's a good point. I mean, maybe Trish, you can dive in a little bit on this one too. Sure. But I think, I think, you know, I, if you think about any town, they usually have a DPW department. They usually have engineering department, and they re repaving roads on an annual basis. And you're going and, mainten and doing the maintenance throughout the town. Usually, a town will have what's called a comprehensive master plan that'll think about 10 to 15 years out in terms of what the town wants to do, not only for its roads, as for its land uses, development, schools, and all those things. And 
types of plans, it'll talk about your goals about connecting from a mobility perspective, a pedestrian bikes, cars perspective of the things that you want to do. And I think it was that plan that led to some of the recommendations that you had in 2016 and 2017 that you, you all, without us being here, did that study to identify the things that you thought were critical to win that plan. That's why Trish spent a lot of time talking at the beginning about what were some of those things that were our marching orders to take to that next level. So it's not just words, it shows up in pictures to see if you like them or don't like them. So to answer your question, it becomes what does a town want to move forward with? Do they want to do the whole thing, a part of it? Do they want to just do some sidewalks to Kathy's point? And you can kind of shape what that project could look like. You would still need to work with your DPW department, and I'm sure your town has certain standards and objectives about when you're building roads, meeting your own standards that you put in place as you do those maintenance options too. So it's a little bit of a hybrid. Trish, I'm not sure if you want to expand on part so of that. So for, yes, and you're, you're correct. So the standards that are out there or, uh, that we're looking at are accessibility, universal accessibility standards. So it's either the American Disabilities Act or the Massachusetts um, Architectural Access Code for you know, uh, pedestrian mobility within a public right of way. So that's what we're looking for for the sidewalk designs. Um, you can go in front of the boards to get a variance from those standards and you have to have justi uh, justification to do that. Because this is a state highway, it, it is. It's, a, it's a, a rural roadway that's within the town of Yarmouth, but it's, it's um, facilitated and operated by Massachusetts Department of Transportation. You would have to go in front of them you know, talk to them about the variance, they would actually be the proponent for the variance to get approval through the boards. So that's really the, the standards themselves. Um, in terms of historic content, that's true, but it's a public way. So it's, you know, they have to weigh whether or not the mobility of, of pedestrians in a historic content, how exactly the variance would, you know, how the design would deviate from the standards. The other thing it might do is open up some funding choices too. So other communities look at this as an opportunity that if we can work in a very collaborative way, maybe it opens up funding and maybe we can get some of those dollars so the town doesn't have to pay for some of this. And as Trish mentioned, the ownership of the road, Mass Highway versus town, those things factor in too. Right. Yeah, I th let's keep going with more yep. comments, yeah. I hope that's better. <laughs> I'm not turning it off, I swear. No. <laughs> uh, if you could go to the next slide, actually. Sure. I, uh, unfortunately, Betty, sorry. Nope. Uh, I understand uh, what you're saying. Yeah. I, would, I would love to have some form of definition for Minden Lane there where the, uh, the lines are, whether or not it's a raised bed or some form of lines, uh, where the actual green is, the, the, where it defines the lane, yes. Um, what you were talking about before, where it opens up into a V, essentially, that's how people treat the space now and treat the lane to go to the parking space, where they cut off all of the, that parking and treat it, because there's no defined curb, there's no defined space there. They actually come in at an angle instead of making a right turn. There, yes. Like cu cutting this way, for example. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. And, uh, you know, there is, uh, that's incredibly dangerous for pedestrians, but it's also for all the people that go and, uh, uh, have treatment there at the pediatrics, which is incredibly busy. People walking there and people cutting off the access there, people cutting off that lane. People do it every day. Every single person that parks in the back there almost does that every single time. So to have some form of definition that defines how that lane is to be and where people are to drive, I think would make a difference, not just uh, to us on the lane in terms of our perspective, but in terms of safety for all the people, all the uh, invitees of that space, I think would make a, a huge difference there. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, see, it did turn off. I had to turn it back on. Speaking to what Anthony says, and I'm not in disagreement, I absolutely agree with him, even though that you know, restricts our parking. I agree that there needs to be more definition there because people coming in and out of Minden Lane, literally everybody going into the pediatrics or, you know, just you trucks, yeah, anybody, cuts that corner. And, you know, he's right, There, there's no delineation. But you can do that delineation in a lot of ways, which 
they've never done in town. And that's part of the problem because the other thing is, if you're trying to walk out of Minden Lane, you know, doing the green area that you have there is great, but if you do both of those solid raised green areas, people are gonna have to walk on those because otherwise that lane is very narrow. And as it is now, um, if you have a uh, disposal person going up on Saturday to, you know, get trash from behind the build, you know, the buildings or any of the people that live up there, they cut the corner and the people that are trying to walk from like where Anthony lives in down Minden Lane, there's nothing that keeps them from doing that and they don't look and they do it fast and someday somebody's gonna get hit by one of those cars or trucks that are cutting that edge. So I wholeheartedly agree with him that there needs to be some delineation there that it is a road because we actually have people last summer who parked their cars in the middle of the road to go to Happy Fish I mean, literally left their car, no, up. They actually cut and parked right in Minden Lane. There is nothing that clearly designates Minden Lane as a road versus a driveway. And people see that as a parking area instead of an actual road that goes up to people's houses up there. And that's a definite problem there. Thank you. Still on. I wonder if there is a way not to lose some of what is being said tonight as a phase in to having the town and your company pick some of the really salient safety and clarity issues to both help the businesses and some of the accessibility that wouldn't take another two to three years of going through what it will take to implement however this concept process takes place. But it seems to me you're hearing and your work has produced a lot that could be used as a phase in between now and the next town meeting, not on and on, which I know you have to do and should do, Thank you. I wonder if in any of the graphic representations that we see here, like the maps or the, where does the state land end and the town land begin? Um, and is that clearly marked throughout the village and the roads, et cetera? So yeah, as I stated earlier, um, unfortunately this is a tough one, but this heavy line here and uh -huh. this heavy line here, it's usually about where the state line um, and, and in, is. in particular, can I see where that heavy So line actually, is? if you, uh, yeah, it, even on the plan view, I just want to, we show it in a different color here, so it's pretty, um, so I believe it's in through here. And that line can there. you show me where the fountain is relative to that line? I uh, we, don't, we don't have to show it on this map. Um, Let's see if I can see it over here. Horse trough, I should say. Line. Yep. Yeah, it's Lauren, pretty much right on the curb line, line right there. Right. Yep. It's right it's there. Pretty close to where it, it, where but the red line is, that's it, where the It's fountain. quite possible yep. that the black line intersects and goes right through the fountain. It is. And it's also possible, may I say, that this land here is not state land. Yes. It could be part of the town land, correct. Right. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. 
thank you. I mean, this piece in here, I would say this is all state, and then that, here, that would be town. And this price down too. Yes, yeah, so anything I believe from here down. Got it. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, so um, I just want to say thank you. Like, I, I know um, there was a lot of great comments tonight. I know that there was different opinions, and that's that's to be expected. Um, I, I really appreciate everyone's time and effort in this. It really, really does help us out. And I think you see, no matter whatever we move forward with, th we're going to try to come back with some tweaks and some changes and really talk it through. Some some of them might need to come back and explain a little bit more detail, like the like the right of way lines and what's happening here, and explain a few more things. We took notes on that as well. We've clearly heard some things that a lot of people don't like about some areas, so we can and actually start to take some of those things away and simplify at the same time as well. And where there is a little bit of you know back and forth, maybe we need to explore a couple of tweaks in certain areas to, to explore some of these ideas and, and have you weigh in a little bit more on it as well. So um, that's been really, really helpful to us as well. I'm not sure, Kathy, if you want to close us out tonight with anything specific. And So if on the behalf of the consultants, thank you very much. Kathy? No, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I know it's uh, a long slog to listen through all of this, but we really appreciate you giving us your input because that's how things get done, and that's how we know that we're getting a project that the community support. So thank you very much.